and we got to keep things pretty tight. So I'll, I will give it to 10 one and then we'll start rolling here. Hi, everybody. My name is Lee Vinsel. I'm a professor at Virginia Tech. Welcome to Saturday Panel 7, The Importance of Military Infrastructure, Temporary, Permanent, and In-Between. Um, we're going to kick right into the papers, starting off with Eric. I do want to say we're asking um, if you could, if you do have comments and questions throughout the talks, if you could put them in the Zoom chat, we would really appreciate it. We're going to run through the four papers. Uh, and then um, go over to Angela for some brief commentary and then go to Q&A. So Eric, please start us off and introduce yourself as you do. Hi, good morning, everyone. Thank you for coming. I'm Eric Paranovic. I'm a doctoral candidate at Temple University. Um, I was previously a Guggenheim Fellow at Air and Space with Dr. Larry Burke as my advisor. Uh, prior to that, I was a, a Fulbright recipient, um, and I am currently an adjunct researcher at the RAND Corporation. So. I'm going to kick us off this morning and I'm going to try to do the share screen thing. Zoom's still not my favorite thing in the world. All right, everybody see that? Okay, great. So, my paper this morning, as you can see, is um, entitled Practical Asia by Ambition West Germany Military Aviation Infrastructure in the F 104 Starfighter Crisis of 1960 66. So, at the time of its acquisition by the Federal Republic of Germany in 1960, the Lockheed F 104 Starfighter was touted as a technological marvel that met a broad spectrum of neophyte Luftwaffe strategic needs. However, by 1966, it found itself mired in scandal as it struggled to safely operate the aircraft. In the first six years of operations, it suffered 34 fatalities and 67 lost aircraft, flight accidents, and equipment failures. In reaction, the public and the press continually excoriated the government's ineptitude in preventing the untimely deaths while flying a plane previously touted as a panacea solution to a broad spectrum of strategic concerns. In early 1966, Luftwaffe's leadership was replaced and the Starfighter fleet was grounded for several months until a full spectrum of reforms could be instituted to bring the crisis to an end. This move had been avoided by prior leadership <clears throat> as the Starfighter represented a large portion of the Luftwaffe's nuclear strike potential and its removal from service effectively nullified NATO's largest European Air Force. However, after several months of intense reform, the Starfighter returned to service and the loss rate dropped appreciably over the following months and years. However, an issue that needed to be overcome was one that had dogged the Bundeswehr and Luftwaffe from the outset. And then Luftwaffe from the outset, the, its inability to safely operate due to an absence of needed infrastructure. This work focuses on the safety and maintenance of infrastructure shortcomings, physical, logistical, and human, that directly influence the, this high accident rate. Within the primary sources, the adequate training or lack of pilots to operate their own aircraft in the adverse climate of Northern Europe, as well as issues with the aircraft's license manufacturer, often prevail as the highest profile rationales behind the checkered safety record. However, the sources also frequently point to the quick band of developed physical infrastructure, log logistical infrastructure, and human infrastructure in the form of experienced maintenance personnel as key drivers of the Starfighter crisis. In its ambition to acquire as many aircraft as possible, West Germany neglected the required infrastructure accompaniments needed to operate the aircraft either safely or effectively. Its leadership instead relegated foundational requirements like covered hangar space, heated maintenance facilities, runways of sufficient length and traction, centralized logistics, or recruiting and retaining sufficient number of qualified maintenance technicians as matters of secondary concern. Investigations conducted by NATO and Lockheed in 1965 and 66 respectively found that the Luftwaffe had invested much more energy in procuring and producing the Starfighter than had been dedicated in, <clears throat> had been dedicated to proper attention to logistics, infrastructure, and training to catastrophic consequences. The Lockheed team went so far as to say that the, that the Luftwaffe Starfighter displayed, quote, a palpable lack of maintenance, end quote. The unwillingness of leadership to invest adequate resources in its mundane but critical requirements engendered a deadly crisis. Oh, sorry. Managing the Starfighter. So the Starfighter was a marvel when it was unveiled in the 1950s. If you've ever seen one, it's a crazy looking aircraft. It looks like it should be able to fly. But the radical design ensured the aircraft ensured the aircraft possessed unforgiving flight characteristics and required significant training and skill to safely operate. The US Air Force, with its extensive resources, established infrastructure, and experienced personnel, experienced multiple safety issues in operating the aircraft. By April 1961, 49 of 296 Starfighters were lost in accidents with 18 pilot fatalities. By the end of 1958, the year it was introduced, the Air Force reduced its order of starfighters from the anticipated 722 down to 296 of all types. And all variants of the starfighter left service by 1969 with little commended service. Relative to the US Air Force, the Luftwaffe was a neophyte organization that was barely five years old. It had underdeveloped infrastructure, logistics, and insufficient personnel. 
And <clears throat> compounding some experience, the F-104G, that they purchased, which was the German layer of the NATO model, was significantly more complex compared to the F-104A and C operated by the US. Lockheed radically altered the base starfighter airframe and electronics package to meet Western requirements. The aircraft evolved from a lightweight interceptor to a heavy multi-role platform capable of all-weather interception, reconnaissance, close air support, and, and nuclear delivery. It possessed a cutting-edge electronic suite that entered production and frontline service before it was fully evaluated and thus suffered from catastrophic cubing problems. Physical infrastructure. So the Luftwaffe's leadership invested little attention or resources in developing physical infrastructure to meet the starfighter's demanding needs. Per NATO regulations, it was required to furnish protective shelters for its F-104 units, but left them largely unbuilt due to a 30 million German mark gap in funds, even as it spent more than 200 million marks in development costs. Starfighters were instead frequently stored in the open with nothing more than a tarp to protect them from the inclement weather that prevails for much of the year in Northern Europe. This constant exposure to the elements degraded the sense of electronic equipment, mechanical systems, and hydraulics within the aircraft while exposing it to constant weathering. This practice in turn negatively impacted flight performance and safety in an aircraft that already possessed challenging flight characteristics. A contemporary newspaper account derided the practice as being the equivalent of storing a computer in a gazebo. Compounding the poor storage is the fact that maintenance or repair facilities were similarly limited, but maintenance hangars existed were largely without heat or power, which greatly limited the amount of work to be done within them. For instance, it, the time it took to conduct a basic to overhaul the Starfighter was six to eight months, uh, due in large part to the lack of covered infrastructure. Uh, despite being aware of this problem for years, it was only in 1965, after a NATO investigation was conducted into the matter, that the need to expedite the construction of covered hangar space was, given, was deemed a request worthy of justification. In a best-case scenario, the F-104 required a prolonged warm-up time of 10 to 15 minutes under optimal weather conditions to ensure the electronic suite functioned properly. However, even under ideal conditions, the computer system was prone to failure. Um, the LM3 inertial navigation system had an absolute runtime of just 84 minutes and a functional runtime of 60 after which it provided the pilot with deviations around five kilometers. As a result, the navigation and targeting systems were impaired in operational altitudes under 6,000 meters, and inclement weather greatly impeded this warm-up process and the subsequent safe flight, safe flight operation of the aircraft as it exposed, exposed electronics to luminous damp. This ensured that alarm starts were all but impossible in poor weather, as the electronics we could not operate under those conditions. Due to the lack of investment in state and suitable hangar infrastructure, the Starfighter fleet was effectively rendered all but useless for much of the year in Northern Europe. Investments in runway infrastructure were also lacking. The F-104G requ absolutely required airfields with a level and well-paved runway of at least 8,200 square, 8,200 feet in length for safe operations. Anything shorter than those distances could and often did result in overshooting the runway to deadly consequence. However, runways at multiple starfighter bases were not lengthened when the aircraft was first acquired. And by 1965, it was found that runways at multiple bases were, were dangerously uneven and in the need of anti-skid resurfacing. Ironically, one seat feature of safety infrastructure that they had invested money into was an emergency aircraft capture system. However, it was so problematic as to be rendered largely ineffective um, as it had the potential to destroy the very aircraft it was meant to capture and save, which happened multiple times. Logistics. From the outset, logistics infrastructure was viewed as a matter of least concern by the Defense Ministry. Problems with the organization of logistics and sourcing spare parts were identified from the outset um, by the Federal Office for Defense Technology and Procurement which stated that in, purchase, in, in pursuing the purchase agreement of Lockheed, the Defense Ministry had neglected to include provisions that would compel the company to provide basic materials and equipment for the care and maintenance of the F-104, including technical manuals and other documentation published in German, or a sufficient supply of spare parts. This undercut the timely preparation and pre complete procurement of the aircraft, aircraft-based materials, um, while delivery of ground testing and maintenance equipment, spare parts, and English language documentation did begin in 1960, the ambiguity surrounding Bond's ability to compel Lockheed to meet its more its, its needs um, forced the Federal Office of Procurement to scramble on its own to source these basic requirements. These issues remained present for a, over a year later in 1961, um, even as the Defense Ministry tripled the Starfighter procurement to 700 aircraft from 250. Uh, there was continual administrative ambiguity as to who was responsible for the logistics of the aircraft. Um, regardless, the Little Office leadership forecast that logistics, procurement, spare parts, and sourcing equipment would be the largest challenges it would face without offering any meaningful means to mitigate or forestall them. Um, in 1962, uh, the Luftwaffe even was even or siphoned away some of its ground testing and equipment and spare parts to West German industry to facilitate the faster production of starfighters, which was known, which they, they knew at the time would cause major issues, but again, offered no mitigation strategy. The same NATO investigation in 1965 lambasted the organization of logistics as woefully unprepared for the rigors of operating starfighter and identified a general shortage of maintenance and testing equipment needed to safely operate the aircraft, as well as a general dearth of spare parts. However, its habitually inefficient logistics remain a significant challenge. 
And by 1966, there was often a multi-week backlog between a parts requisition and, and its delivery. Uh, the training of technical personnel was a problem that the liftoff's leadership believed they could address in real time. Each starfighter wing required 21 ground staff and technicians to keep each of its 42 aircraft flying. Of that total, three worked exclusively on maintenance tasks, while six were just required for, to, to uh, manage the computer system. Due to the production and deployment timeline, the Air Force was compelled to, con was compelled to conduct abbreviated three-month training courses for enlisted technical personnel, which left no margin for error as the units simultaneously transitioned to the starfighter as the training was conducted. Um, compounding this, most of the maintenance fell on the shoulders of short-term conscripts, who initially were just serving a 12-month service term, but eventually that was up to 18 months. Uh, the reliance on conscripts ensured that there was little chance of retaining institutional knowledge among ground crews, um, and it's exacerbated the other, the other structural inefficiencies. Generally, Johannes Steinhoff, uh, who would eventually come to lead Eric, through the crisis period. Just so you know, you got about a minute left. Thanks. Uh, Postulated that this essentially was, had undercut its ability to um, operate the aircraft effectively or safely. Uh, throughout the 1960s, the leadership of the Air Force effectively lied to the Bundestag whenever it was asked to explain how it could handle the starfighter of its personnel, saying that it always had the matter in hand, even though it could never keep people in the ranks long enough to actually learn how to, to uh, operate or take care of the aircraft. To mitigate that shortcoming, it actually um, essentially hired personnel from the Western Aviation Sector, as well as Lockheed, to come and do maintenance on the Starfighter with the conscripts. Uh, but even into 1967, there were 9,000, there's depths of 9,000 technicians. So in conclusion, uh, West Germany acquired the F-104 in the hope of that the cutting edge aircraft would signal the country's arrival as a European military power and set up for a leadership role within NATO. However, in its drive to acquire and field the advanced starfighters as possible, the defense ministry neglected the mundane but critical infrastructure needed to safely operate the aircraft with deadly results. By relegating its foundational infrastructure requirements as a matter of little concern, leadership demonstrated a baffling lack of foresight or understanding of the Starfire space requirements, even as it spent immense amounts of money to acquire hundreds of the aircraft to the centerpiece of its aircraft and of its air combat inventory. This, um, this, it, this serves as a, a, a failure of leadership to invest adequate resources in the mundane. The critical requirements um, demonstrates a very stark example that advanced technology can be, can be rendered ineffective, if not overtly fatal to its users, if it's not supported by proper infrastructure. And that's it, thank you. That's beautiful. Thank you, Eric. Um, let's kick right over to Larry and keep it going. Good work, Eric. Thank you. All right, uh, well, thank you all for showing up this morning. Um, so me, uh, got my uh, doctorate from Carnegie Mellon in uh, 2014. Since then, I have been a postdoctoral fellow at the Naval Academy. Uh, spent uh, most of the last five years working for the National Air and Space Museum. Uh, and then within uh, just about two months ago, uh, I had moved over to a new position as uh, aviation curator at the National Museum of the Marine Corps. Um, have a, uh, a book expected to come out in the spring at the dawn of air power. Uh, and you can find that uh, it's coming from Naval Institute Press, but I have seen it on Amazon too. Uh, if you've got a, a Naval Institute membership, it's cheaper. So uh, at any rate, um, so my talk today, so I pull this up. All right, uh, speaking about a, a floating city, the aircraft carrier is mobile infrastructure. And uh, the idea for this did come out of uh, work that I was doing at the National Air and Space Museum um, and is, is maybe less of an academic talk than it is a, a, a bit of a insight into um, uh, looking at, at uh, how exhibits are developed. Um, so as I say, uh, one of the things I was doing at Air and Space was working on the team that was developing the new exhibit uh, for military aviation since 1945, and that is expected to open the end of 2025, at least last I heard. Uh, as the curator of naval aviation, I was naturally responsible for trying to tell the Navy and Marine Corps aspects of that period. And the centerpiece for this part of the exhibit will be the museum's uh, fantastic scratch built model. And is it going to change? Yeah, there we go. Um, of uh, the USS Enterprise CVN 65, not to be confused with NCC 1701, which is also at the Air and Space Museum. Uh, at any event, this is the, the, the ship as it appeared roughly 1974, 75. Uh, and the plan was, and as far as I know still is, to leverage the striking object through the use of some sort of interactive 
where people will be able to explore the model in more detail. So the question for the team then became, well, all right, what kind of things do people want to know about the ship as represented in the model? And uh, we soon came up with three categories. That is, what is visible on the exterior of the model, uh, the interior spaces dedicated to the carrier's mission, and uh, the interior spaces dedicated to keeping the ship itself and its crew operating. Now, the first two categories address the idea of the carrier as a floating airport, while the third addresses the carrier as a city at sea, both analogies you're probably very familiar with but haven't really thought of. And it's these two descriptions I would like you to reconsider in this talk and perhaps see that they are both more comprehensive and more insightful than you might initially think. And lastly, something that both of these analogies frequently overlook, though it is something so obvious you may not even think about it at all, despite the fact that it's in the, the title of my paper and it's there at the bottom, that whether you consider it a, a floating airport or a city at sea, this infrastructure is also mobile. It moves from place to place. So uh, the description of the floating airport is an obvious one. Air, aircraft take off from and land on. And given how little time we have, I'll skip over the more obvious feature of the flight deck and the hangar deck and move on to some of the less obvious ways in which this analogy applies. Airports, perhaps more accurately military airfields, have many more features that also need to be present on aircraft carriers. Uh, on a carrier, for instance, the primary flight or pry fly as it's called, handles the duties of an airport tower, granting permission for takeoffs and landings, controlling the immediate airspace around the carrier. Broader airspace control, equivalent to a civil area control center, is done by the appropriately named Carrier Air Traffic Control Center, or CATCC, buried within the hull. On land, once an airplane begins moving anywhere that is not a runway, it's directed by ground control to make sure it doesn't collide with other aircraft or ground vehicles and gets where it needs to go safely. Carriers likewise have a flight deck control room right on the deck where crew use abstract two scale aircraft shapes to plan how to safely move any given aircraft to where it needs to go. And you see two photos there of the, the traditional analog Ouija board. Uh, and we figure it's probably so named because the, the shapes are actually slid around to represent the aircraft rolling. Um, Navy is trying to go to the, the digital that you see there on the bottom right. Uh, but from the photos I've seen so far, the, the controllers are still maintaining it and analog is their primary uh, source of planning. Uh, so uh, the carrier's hangar deck is much like hangars at an airfield. The US Navy practice is generally only to keep spare aircraft and any under heavy repair in the cavernous space under the flight deck. And repair is another word that I think may be underappreciated in this context. It is not simply swapping out parts, uh, the carrier has dedicated workshops for everything from basic wood and metal shaping to fixing electronic components and even some ability to fabricate new parts. And the dramatic picture in the bottom right shows their engine test bay where they can test an engine before putting it back in an aircraft. So you can see that repair is actually quite extensive. Now, aviators, of course, also need to know about the weather they will be flying in. And because they're move around, uh, carriers host a small meteorology department as well, assembling information necessary in order to provide the aviation forecast. Often overlooked, even at airports, is the need to store large quantities of fuel for the aircraft operating there. Now, ashore, this is done with tank farms that you usually don't see if you go to the airport because they're hidden away in isolated places to keep them safe from accidents and to keep the airport safe in the event of an accident at the tank farm. On the carrier, the aviation fuel is kept in tanks at the bottom of the ship where they are safer from enemy attack and accidents on the flight or hangar deck. And that's the, the yellow spaces or the red spaces that you see in the diagram there. <clears throat> Current US supercarriers have the capacity for 3 million gallons of jet fuel in these spaces. The liquid is pumped up from the tank to the edges of the flight deck or hangar deck where the crew in purple shirts, appropriately known as grapes, can hook up flexible lines in order to refuel aircraft almost anywhere on the flight deck. Of course, these are military aircraft and most need ordnance as well as fuel to complete their missions. At an airfield, the ordnance would be stored in bunkers well away from both the main operations area and the tank farm, again for safety. Once again on carrier, as with the jet fuel, carriers store ordnance in spaces near the bottom of the ship. Furthermore, the bombs and missiles are stored in pieces, warheads in one space, guidance systems in another, fuses in yet a third, and rocket motors in a fourth space. 
A system of special elevators brings each piece up from its respective armored magazine to an area where ordnance techs assemble the pieces into working weapons. Additional elevators then take the assembled weapons up to the flight deck where they are attached to the aircraft. And they're not all done with manpower as you see there with the missiles. Finally, both airports and carriers need to be able to handle emergencies with airplanes. Carriers indeed have their own dedicated emergency departments capable of dealing with aircraft accidents, crashes, fires, and the like. The main difference between the carrier crash crews and those ashore is that the carrier equipment is generally short enough to be able to pass under the wings of parked aircraft if necessary. An exception to this is the large mobile crane, examples of which you see at the bottom there, capable of lifting and moving any aircraft on the carrier out of the way in order to quickly return the launch and or landing areas to serviceability. Now this brings us to the third category, the unseen things that keep the ship and the air wing running. The analogy of the floating city is often pulled out in connection with the fact that they all need some place to eat, sleep, and do their jobs. Now of that 6,000 to 6,500, only about 12 to 1,500 of these are associated with operating or the vast majority of them maintaining the aircraft. They're associated with the air wing and transfer on and off with the aircraft. That leaves 5,000 or so permanently attached to the carrier who keep the ship operating as a ship. Operating and maintaining the engines, the steering, electrical distribution and communications networks, heating and cooling, plumbing, preparing and serving food, and of course, cleaning the dishes afterwards, laundry services, the list goes on. This city must supply utilities and other hotel services to its airport as well as its own people. Now, while some jobs on a carrier may be the same as on any other Navy ship, the scale of the job on the carrier is much different. Whether measured in crew size or displacement, the carrier is at least an order of magnitude larger than a modern cruiser, the next largest traditional Navy vessel still in use today. In fact, one of the things about carriers is that their hulls are designed to be large enough to float while carrying the air wing and all its supplies, as well as providing the necessary acreage to operate the aircraft. The result is that the space inside the hull is at less of a premium than in smaller vessels with much smaller float, uh, floating capacities. The carrier's large size by whatever measurement means that some things make sense on a carrier that do not make sense on smaller ships. Carrier has a small hospital with fully equipped operating rooms, a dental surgery, and of course the specialized medical personnel to staff them. TV and radio production facilities provide shipwide news services, entertainment, Larry, you just muted yourself, I think, bud. Uh, yeah, uh, where, where did I leave off? Uh, entertainment. And you have about a minute left. Yep, I'm good. Uh, okay, TV and radio production facilities provide shipwide news services, entertainment, even crewmate educational programs. A dedicated chapel space. Uh, and many carriers have even carved out room for a museum dedicated to a history of the ship's namesake. Now, time prevents me from delving any further into the many ways in which these analogies are more apt than you may think. And indeed, this was one of the problems we quickly encountered in planning for the exhibit. The interactive could probably only address one, maybe two of these categories without being too complicated and or overwhelming visitors. So what would our visitors most wanna learn about? Well, when I left the Air and Space Museum, this was still under discussion. And unfortunately, our public testing had not revealed any clear winners and losers in this case. And while I am disappointed that I'm no longer helping to see this exhibit develop through to its opening, uh, on the other hand, it means I no longer have to make the difficult decision of which information visitors will be presented with, unlike trying to get this talk into a mere 10 minutes. And that's me. Beautiful, thank you, Larry. Very good work. Uh, Frank, let's kick it right over to you. Well, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Quick bi uh, biography on myself. I'm a curator of modern military history at the National, at the Smithsonian Institution's National Museum of American History. Uh, prior to coming to the Smithsonian, I worked for Naval History and Heritage Command. And prior to that, I was the historian at the U.S. Navy CB Museum in Port Huanimi, California. And for any Navy vets, you also know it as Port Who Needs Me. Uh, good old COVID delayed everything. So I can brag and say in uh, December of 2020, uh, this book was published by Erie University Press, an honorable place in American air power, civil air patrol, coast patrol operations, 1942, 1943. Uh, also, this talk has actually also already been published. It came out in the Northern Mariner as an article a couple of weeks ago. So with no further ado, 
Uh, let me see if I can get this to work. Alrighty, can everyone see the slides? Nod, yes. Okay, outstanding. There you go. We've had our title slide. If I will, if it'll let me move forward. There we go. Uh, if you'd like the paper, there's the QR code to download the paper uh, from the Northern Mariner. Uh, long story short, this is a presentation about a simple steel box, uh, namely the T-series of U.S. Navy landing pontoons. This is more importantly a story about a forgotten Anglo-American relationship between an inventor and an innovator who together birth structures which further the logistical buildup of personnel, supplies, and vehicles critical to the success of the invasion of Normandy, France. The brainchild behind the Navy landing pontoon is John Noble Laycock, seen here on the left. He is a Naval Academy graduate. He's a graduate of Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute, and he will go on to serve in the Navy's Civil Engineer Corps. Now, he has a variety of assignments in the Western Hemisphere until mid-March 1939, when he accepts an offer from Rear Admiral Ben Morrell, Chief of the Bureau of Yards and Docks, or BUDOCS, to come to Washington, D.C. to be the War Plans Officer, and his job there is tasked to review and prepare all of the BUDOC sections of the Navy's various war plans. Foremost among these is War Plan Orange for a potential war with the Imperial Japanese military. In this case, they're concerned about how do we build advanced bases to kind of march across the Pacific, lighter age, the movement of cargo between, varying, uh, between vessels of varying sizes is a paramount issue here. Now, as early as 1932, Budox began contemplating the use of standardized pontoon units for advanced bases, bases for lighter age purposes. In 1936, a member of the Navy's Construction Corps noticed a sectional steel pontoon barge for gold dredge under construction in San Francisco. He provided Budox with details and drawings of how he felt these box sections could be connected to form a barge. You watch Discovery Channel and you've seen that show Gold Rush. The same gold dredges you see there, that's the pontoon tank. Now, in 19, uh, Laycock will first examine these sketches in the summer of 1939, but he finds faults with the proposal. He says, you know, this won't really work. But beginning in July of 1940, he will build a model for experimentation. That is the exact model seen there on the left. The Smithsonian had this for half a century and nobody knew what it was, by the way. Uh, but what this model will demonstrate is the feasibility of connect connecting individual pontoons using continuous angles to create a well diaphragm sectional box girder. Now, Laycock tries to contract with a company to produce the finer details of assembling these. The company doesn't get him results fat quick enough. Laycock decides to take his family vacation, much to his wife's chagrin, and use the time to actually figure out how we can link these up. But long story short, he basically takes this model, scales it up into steel. Now, there are seven criteria which would factor into the final dimension of the pontoon. You can see them here on the left. Uh, by February of 1941, Budox enters in a contract with the Pittsburgh Des Moines Steel Company to fabricate the pontoon units for testing and evaluation. Two designs will be constructed, the five by seven by five foot T6 steel box, which you can see there on the right, and the five by seven by seven T7, and that has a curved section on one end for use as the prow and barges. Now, after its withdrawal from Western Europe in June of 1940, the British Chiefs of Staff will stand up what's known as Combined Operations Headquarters. Within this command was a development center tasked with examining and experimenting with craft and equipment for combined operations. By summer of 1941, its commandant, Captain Thomas Andrew Hussey, Royal Navy, senior on left and right, receives instructions to investigate problems likely to be encountered with large-scale amphibious operations in Europe, particularly the landing of vehicles and supplies. And foremost among these is our title, Bridging the Gap from Ship to Shore. From November to December of 41, Hussey will lead an Admiralty delegation to Washington to share and discuss designs for three amphibious assault craft. And while he's there in the week prior to the attack on Pearl Harbor, he visits Narragansett Bay, Rhode Island. And this is when he will first learn about Budox's new pontoons. Hussey went, goes, wow, this is great tech. We can use this for amphibious operations. Tells combined op uh, operations about it. They go, that's great. And they do nothing. But after the successful Allied landings in North Africa, Operation Torch in November of 42, Hussey, who is now the Director of Experiments and Staff Requirements, learns about the next target, which is gonna be Sicily, Operation Husky. He examines sounding charts of the island, particularly the invasion beach areas, and goes, we have a problem. You have gently sloping seafloors, and the landing ship's tanks, or LSTs, have a bad tendency to ground out in these very shallow beaches uh, about 500 feet from the shoreline. Now you can waterproof a vehicle, it can ford through three feet of water, but it can't ford through more than that. And so basically your vehicles are gonna be stranded about 300 feet from the beach. How do you solve the problem? Hussey's alarmed, he brings the issue before the chief of combined operations at Vice Admiral Louis Mountbatten, who recommends he assemble a team of technical experts. They meet in December of 42, but the only thing they're aware of is the US Army's Treadway Bridge seen here. Uh, which they had used in the torch landings. However, you read at the bottom, there's some problems with these. Uh, they, they're just not reliable for the task at hand. 
So Hussey comes up with a solution. He remembers the American pontoons and says, what if you build a floating roadway with these? Can't you not tow them to the beaches, place them in front of the LSTs, and they'll provide a nice means to drive the vehicles right on the beach? Mountbatten goes, brilliant, love it. Make it possible, go do it. But when Hussey arrives in Washington on March 443, he discovers the US Navy has no idea who he is or what he's doing. Thankfully, he finds Laycock. And together, they, figure, they sit down, they explain the problem. Hussey wants a 350 foot long pontoon barge. Laycock says, we can't do this in the time we have allotted. But instead, he designs what you see here at the bottom in model scale, these 175 foot long, two by 30 pontoon causeways. If you take two of these and you overlap them like a slide roll, you can place them in front of an LST, get a maximum length of 325 feet, and thus bridge the gap. On March 18th, uh, they will hold the trials in Narragansett Bay. So you can see your lightning fast development here. Uh, the causeway, essentially when they get it in front of the LST, you can do this in eight minutes and actually get vehicles driving ashore in eight minutes. They try the Army's Treadway Bridge, it takes 45 minutes. The planners say, go with the pontoons. And so on July 10th, 43, when Husky commences, 10 LSTs are actually going to side carry the causeways on the side of the vessels. Six are going to tow them. Within 23 days, around the clock shifts, they're able to get 10,000 vehicles ashore using this technology. The following month in Quebec, the Allied leaders will approve a plan for the invasion of Normandy. This is known as Overlord, and its naval component is Neptune. Now, they recognize the need for port facilities, but Cherbourg is heavily fortified. They've tried this before at Dieppe, didn't work. So they say, let's just bring our own harbors with us. And these are known as the Mulberry Harbor. One will be positioned Mulberry A off Omaha Bay Beach at saint laurent sur mer The other Mulberry B will be placed off British Gold Beach at Aramanche. The plan here is that these can discharge 6,000 tons of cargo daily, and they will provide sheltered water by June 10th and be fully established by June 20th. Similar to Sicily, uh, the Bay of the Seine has flat sandy beaches, near flat slopes, you have a tidal range of 21 feet, high water dur duration of only three hours. So at low tide, a ship can find itself half a mile from shore, grounded out. But even before these landings, uh, Hussey and Laycock are already talking, and their idea is, well, let's build a massive lightering barge. Uh, Laycock's going to take Hussey's ideas, he basically merges three of those causeways together to create a six by 30 barge. Uh, during tests in Rhode Island in August of 43, they can actually load 10 32-ton medium tanks, two 11-ton half-tracks in less than five minutes aboard one of these and ferry them three quarters of a mile in an equal amount of time. Crazy logistics. Bringing in some naval aviation here for you, Larry. A uh, naval aviator flies over one of these bizarre contraptions, goes, what the hell is that? Sorry, kids. And thinks it looks like a rhinoceros. And this is how these become known as rhino ferries. And if you look here at the bottom of the sketch, you can see it has kind of a horn there. Now as work, the rhinos are gonna be assembled in England. As work is developing on that, Supreme Headquarters Allied Expeditionary Force says, well, until the mulberries are established, we're gonna need something else. So why not use those pontoon causeways again? And so the plan here is that they're going to position two of these on each American beach. They're gonna position seven and the British beaches, two gold, two sword, uh, two gold, two Juno, and one at sword. Uh, the, design, the idea here is that any amount, uh, at any point uh, during the tidal shift, you'll be able to offload cargo at these blisters, which are spaced on eagles either side there of the causeway, the red arrow is pointing to one of them. So fast forward now to D-Day. Uh, the LSTs will bring the rhino ferries to all five invasion beaches. Uh, American toes go well, the British lose one rhino apiece for each of their three invasion forces, as well as a number of the rhino tugs. Heavy seas uh, complicate the actual marriage process of getting that barge and aligning with the LST seen there in the upper left. But by the afternoon of D-Day, all five beaches have these rhino ferries coming ashore, bringing vehicles, bringing armor to support the invasion forces. Following day on June 7th, with the beaches secure, uh, the Allied rhino force will commence 24-hour operations except at Omaha, uh, excuse me, never mind, I'm getting ahead of myself. Uh, as you can see here in this photograph, as well as the description below, uh, the barges are pushed to their limits, uh, but they continue to perform, except for the British, where the British only had half of their rhino ferries operational at Gold, Juno, and Sore beaches, and they still have 100 LSTs that need to be unloaded. So what do they do? They say, well, at the British beaches, we're going to have to bring the LSTs in the shore and dry them out and unload that way. You can see they're in the upper left. But at every beach but Omaha, because of artillery fire, they don't want to do this with the LSTs. Uh, they eventually will decide to take the rhino ferries and use them as lightering barges for Liberty ships, which you can see there in the lower right. Pontoon causeways, these will arrive at all five invasion beaches beginning on June 7th. Again, they're bringing them in sections. 
at Omaha and Utah, the CVs will actually complete installation of the two causeways per beach, and they'll get these finished no later than June 16th. So, uh, meanwhile, from June 16th, 6th to the 13th, 85% of all the vehicles and cargo coming ashore at Utah Beach are either on rhino ferries or causeways. So it's the pontoons bearing the burden of the logistical buildup. Now, the British uh, will actually concurrently assemble all of their causeways. Frank, you yep. got about a minute left, Frank. I know, I'm almost done. Okay. They'll come in all theirs on June 7th, and the British keep going at this until July 28th. Uh, and they're going to be shifting their causeways around constantly. Quite frankly, the British don't make maximum use of them. While the causeways are coming on, on board, the mulberries are rapidly being assembled. Uh, Mulberry A will be first operational on June 16th. Mulberry B doesn't even reach its target figure for 6,000 tons until July 9th. Uh, statistically speaking, though, as you can see there on the bottom of the slides, the mulberry, they're fairly comparable. So how do we evaluate these? Uh, it's very difficult. I put the statistical data there at the bottom. Uh, bottom line is the American rhinos average more daily tonnage than the targets for the mulberry harbors themselves at considerably cheaper cost. The after action reports, the rhinos are all gonna receive high marks, uh, low marks for the primary role, but eventually people say they make fantastic lighter barges. Pontoon causeways get all the praise. People go, this is fantastic technology. These are brilliant. By the way, they'll use them now in every amphibious operation in Europe and the Pacific thereafter. Big problem is the British don't have experience with the American technology. They assign them to British Army personnel, whereas the United States Navy, Seabees, are who man all the pontoon causeways and rhino barges. But all the shortcomings aside here, these provide the Allied forces with a valuable resource and the logistical buildup vital for overlord success. And the development of the causeway and in turn the rhino ferry would never have occurred had you not had two kind of middle managers here in Laycock and in Hussey. And Laycock's developing these things for use in the Pacific. He's not thinking of amphibious operations. Hussey needs to find a solution. By working together, they're gonna to develop these structures that will serve amphibious operations, not only there in Europe, but to this point in time, we still have this technology. These are really an unsung hero in the invasion of Opera in Operation Overlord. And I hope you enjoy reading the longer paper. And I hope I got this in under 10 minutes. Thank you. Thanks, all. Frank. That was great. Uh, we're going to hand it right over to Jack and then to Angela. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm just going to share my screen. Can everybody see that? You're in presenter view uh, or edit view, actually. So you need to press uh, present. Yep. Yep. Here we go. There you go. I'm just going to try and get this in the corner so you guys can't see it. Um, so my paper is called Before Paperclip, the American Campaign to Acquire German Military Technology, 1919 to 1935. Um, from the title slide here, uh, you can see um, this is like a little shot from a movie. Even if you are not familiar with exactly what Operation Paperclip is, you are familiar with the fact that the United States recruited Nazi scientists after the Second World War. Um, it's ubiquitous in culture, whether you've seen the X-Files, whether you're a QAnoner, or whether you're a fan of Marvel movies. And this shot right here that you see is actually from the Marvel movie Captain America and the Winter Soldier. Um, but before Paperclip, in the aftermath of World War I, there was another military campaign to acquire German military technology. Um, and I got down into that rabbit hole through this letter that you see right here. So this is a letter from FDR to a friend of his by the name of Charles Fairweather. Fairweather had written to him on behalf of a company he was friends with the CEO of. The company was called the Bausch & Laum Optical Company. They were a supplier for the Navy. And um, the Justice Department had indicted them based on an agreement that they had with another German firm called Carl Zeiss AG. And in this agreement, Bausch and Lam agreed to divide the world in a cartel agreement with Zeiss. They agreed to show Zeiss all their technical information, including classified US military secrets. And they agreed to let Zeiss staff their scientific division with German scientists. Um, the American public was a little shocked at this. Um, various articles were written about this case. Two of the name or two of the headlines that stuck out are Arnold Hitt's peril in Enemy Patents case, and another more sinisterly was uh, titled "The Hand of the Reich 
strangling the American defense industry. So where does this letter come in? Well, the head of Bausch writes to Fairweather to write to FDR to say, hey, would you quash the suit? And FDR does. So two weeks after this letter, the suit is settled. Bausch pays about $10,000 in fees and they continue all their Navy contracts through World War II. So I start moving out from here. I'm like, how the hell do we get here? How do we get to a point where this is okay? And I discover there's multiple of these cases. And through four different case studies, I wanna tell you about how the US military in various forms would be impressed by German technology from World War I. They would go to Europe after the war to acquire that technology by any means, whether espionage or other. And almost every single time they run into a German company that's like, yeah, we'll totally sell everything to you. We need money bad. During the war itself, um, we got kind of into the habit of stealing German tech. Um, President Wilson sets up an office called the Office of the Alien Property Custodian. It's staffed by uh, Pennsylvania Congressman A. Mitchell Palmer. Palmer seizes millions of dollars worth of German physical and intellectual property in the United States during the war itself. Um, but however, this only gets us access to German technology from before the war. Uh, it does not allow the United States access to technologies that were developed during the war itself. Um, and here, and I would like to talk about four different case studies of those technologies where the United States was interested. The, one of the first examples I have is what were known as Kaiser Wilhelm guns, commonly incorrectly referred to as Big Berthas. So at the start of World War I, Paris was under artillery bombardment from the Germans. When the Germans were pushed back in 1915, the bombardment ended. Early in 1918, out of nowhere, shells start falling down on Paris again. Um, you can see in the lower right, that is a map of Paris and every blue dot is a different shell that fell on it in early 1918. So eventually the allies realized this is a super gun. This is an enormous gun that the Germans are firing from almost 90 miles away. Um, sorry, sorry, not 90, 50 miles away, my mistake. Um, so in the armistice agreement, the allies demand any and all access to these guns, but the Germans destroy them. So the US Army sends an ordnance captain by the name of Henry W. Miller, who you can see a picture of there, to go through the French countryside and find whatever he can. He finds one railroad gun casing near Chateau Thierry. Um, afterwards, he, go he goes into Germany itself and he goes to the Krupp factory at Meppen and he actually bribes shell workers for information on the shells. He probably was not able to get access to a gun because he doesn't have very good technical information on them, but his shell information is perfect. Um, at this point, he's kind of sneaking around Krupp and Krupp goes to the American government and they're like, hey, we know you've got a guy sneaking around asking our guys about these guns, what if we just sold them to you? And the American military is like, okay, cool. Uh, we'll buy all your technical secrets. And Krupp is like, no, 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 no. We want a partnership with an American firm. We want to move military operations to the US and we want our scientists to staff the enterprise. And in this case, um, that does not happen. It fails, I think, because Krupp is not able to find an adequate American partner. I'm not certain because I have not gotten into NARA yet. NARA has just reopened this week and I'm very excited to get back into it. Um, but I have, it's, uh, it's my assumption that it doesn't work because they can't find an American partner. Case study two, um, bombing of civilian areas becomes a much bigger thing in World War II, presaging World War I. Um, these bombings are typically done from rigid airships known as Zeppelins. Um, the effect of Zeppelin bombings is actually quite minimal, but Zeppelinitis, the fear of Zeppelin bombings is huge. One bombing raid in March, 1917 causes 300,000 people to flee London um, with huge knock-on effects for war production. 
So after the war, all the Allies want their own Zeppelins. There's three Zeppelins they captured during the war. Unfortunately, and unbeknownst to them, they're all experimental classes that are designed to be flown under different circumstances than normal Zeppelins. The Allies don't know this. So after the war, the US builds its own Zeppelin called ZR-1 based on the captured designs. They also purchase R-38, which they renamed Z uh, ZR-2 and the Roma. So uh, R-38 comes from the UK, Roma comes from Italy. All three are based on those captured designs. All three crash horribly. So at that point, they're like, well, obviously we need to go to the Germans. So they go to Zeppelin and they buy uh, a new airship by the name of the Los Angeles. And here you can see it undergoing stress testing. It went completely vertical and they were still able to maintain control of the aircraft. It's absolutely fascinating. So at that point, the US Army or the US Navy wants more, but they can't get more because Zeppelin is banned from producing aircraft for military purposes. So they go to Zeppelin and they're like, sell us your secrets. And Zeppelin says, no, but we will work with an American company in a partnership. So the Navy introduces them to Goodyear and Goodyear builds a subsidiary called Goodyear Zeppelin, which is today known as Goodyear Blimp. And Goodyear Zeppelin ends up building two uh, new airships for the Navy called the Akron and the Macon. And unfortunately, both of these crash horribly. Um, so in the end, the Navy was successful and able to in getting access to these German technologies, but they could not make the technologies work with what they wanted out of their equipment. And then also the crash of the Hindenburg pretty much killed public interest in uh, Zeppelins and created this image they were dangerous. My third case is aircraft. So during the war, uh, Fokker aircraft were very well known for their devastating effect on American pilots. The most famous Fokker pilot was the Red Baron who flew, uh, who flew an all red Fokker. Fokker himself was actually Dutch. And when the war ended, he fled back to the Netherlands with most of his factory parts and reestablished um, the Fokker factory in the Netherlands. At that point in 1919, the US Army kind of went over, again, same orders get us engine information, get us technical information. They went over to the factory. They start asking questions of Fokker. Fokker stops them and he says, hey, can I just come to America and build a factory there? Uh, Jack, um, you have about a minute left at this point. Okay. So Fokker goes back to America or is brought to America. He establishes Fokker American and Fokker American is a major contractor for aircraft until uh, the early 30s. My final case study revolves optical equipment. So in World War I, the German Navy had about double the accuracy of British guns. So British guns typically hit three to 4% of what they were fired at. German guns typically hit about six to 8%. The Navy um, and private companies were pretty sure this was because of their ranging equipment. So again, after the war, um, the main American optical supplier, Bau, Bausch & Laum, goes to the main German firm, Carl Zeiss, on the orders of the Navy. The Navy tells them, get these technical secrets. And when Bausch gets there, Zeiss is like, we'll work with you in a new renewed partnership. <laughs> um, so they made this whole agreement wherein Zeiss could staff the Bausch division. Um, Bausch would share all its patents and Zeiss would share all its patents. And together, they would produce these instruments for the Navy. Um, and it ends up being quite a success. They're able to adapt a bunch of different things. And it's so successful that FDR kills that suit against Zeiss. So how do we get back here? It's become a piece of military infrastructure. Um, sorry, that was a little bit of a, I had to do it a little quick. But um, th that's my presentation. Thank you. Thanks, thanks Jack. Good work. Uh, Angela, we'll go over to you now. Hi, wonderful. Thank you everybody for being here. Thank you so much for these excellent papers. Uh, so to make it a tie to Jack's paper, so my PhD is actually from the University of Akron and we used to take our dogs to the Goodyear Park to run around the lake. So that's our little connection here. Um, so formerly I was a part of the Army University Press Films team that would make 
films to teach history and doctrine for the U.S. Army, and now I'm a professor at the U.S. Army Command and General Staff College at Fort Leavenworth teaching military history. So again, these are excellent papers. I'm just going to go in order, very brief comments, so then we can get to questions from our attendees. So first with Eric. Eric provides an excellent discussion of the star. Hey, Jack, can you unshare just so um, we, we see Angela? <laughs> no, there we go. Go ahead. Sorry, Angela. Do that. <laughs> you guys are like making me laugh because I just saw like alien ships or something and I was like <laughs> into it. Um, so yeah, Eric provides an incredible overview of the star fighter fleet um, in Germany in the 1960s and the myriad of issues that plagued the fleet. Um, and I have some questions about actually the reform because it seems that the main theme that connects all of these papers is what forces change, what forces reform and the need for innovation. So is that technological demands? Is it leadership? Is it readiness concerns? And also another major theme that connects all these papers is the human element. So the human infrastructure, if you will, that may fuel change or inspire change. So for Eric, my question is, what limited the acceptance of these re reforms? You say in one section that maybe the leadership um, did not realize the extent of the issues, but I wanna know if they are actually, they don't realize it or they refuse to realize it. They refuse to acknowledge it because it's, as you say, less glamorous, like less sexy. No one wants to talk about infrastructure when you have a starfighter fleet. Um, and then once they do realize it, what forces the change? Is it the operational readiness, public outrage over the desk, the NATO investigation? Um, and it seems that the main takeaway is it's another element of the human infrastructure, and that is the leadership infrastructure. So maybe it's not just the personnel for the training or the maintenance or the logistics. Leadership itself can be a key part of that infrastructure discussion, because it seems that it was the leadership infrastructure that needed the rehaul, not just the hangers and the other um, parts of the infrastructure. And then moving on to Larry. So Larry does an excellent job boiling down the aircraft carrier's massiveness and the extensive interior. Some of those, that model and those images were just fabulous. And it's, we always knew that carriers were huge, um, but Larry does an excellent point of pointing out that like the very basic realization that these things are mobile, right? They float, they move. How cool is that? Um, so sometimes even taking the time to realize the most obvious encourages you to ask the most enlightening of questions. So for me, I know you're no longer at um, the Air and Space Museum, but one of the questions I ask is, how do you fit all of this infrastructure, the technology and the people in a floating city that still is able to maneuver in combat? So what are the changes they had to make that makes it actually a piece of military infrastructure, not just basic aircraft carrier? Um, who's next? Oh, Frank. So I had the advantage of actually reading this even before it was published. So I love this. I feel like I know this topic. I have a soft spot for these rhinos now. Um, so Frank dives deep into the development trials and success of the landing pontoons and the rhino barges, um, and especially the role of Laycock and Hussey. And you especially focus on the human element as part of this development and these these innovations. And my question is once operations are complete, so once Overlord, Overlord and Neptune are complete, what do Hussey and Laycock do? What are their continuing roles as part of the war effort? Is it maintenance, training, or further development, right? And then for Jack, Jack, where are your comments? I have stuff everywhere. Yes, so Jack discusses the US military officials um, and how they work with private corporations to access or purchase German military technology um, in the interwar period. And since this is part of your, dis uh, your dissertation, I asked some questions for you to consider. So one of the things might be seem a little more controversial, but can US military officials and corporations be judged for possibly bankrolling um, 
German militarism in the interwar period leading to, leading to World War II. Um, it seems like we gave them a lot of money uh, to increase their military. Um, why is the US getting advancements from the losers of World War I? Why do they seem that they are so advanced that, that we need their technology? And can you make any connections to before the war borrowing um, and sharing of technology as part of the before the Great War arms race? So some things to consider going forward. But it seems like the main themes here are the human element readiness um, and possibly even outrage according to some of the papers. Um, so that's all my comments. Feel free if the graduate students want to reply a little bit um, or if we want to jump right into questions from our audience. Yeah, my, feel, my sense is maybe we should get some questions from the audience on the table too. Angela, I thought that's, that was a wonderful kind of drawing together. So I feel like you've really set us up at this point. Um, and let's see if there are questions from the audience. You can either raise your hand um, or just hop in. Um, by the way, Kathy Steen left a comment for you, Jack. I don't know if you saw it, but Kathy Steen has a um, great book on the, the chemical industry um, that has some stuff on the, that uh, program. I'm, I'm not gonna lie. I, when I came in here and I saw the names and I saw Catherine Steen, <laughs> I, 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 I passed a note to my boyfriend that literally says, holy, one of the audiences is a huge historian. I have the book up. <laughs> um, I actually started doing the APC um, originally, and then I read her book. And it's, it's that moment in grad school when you read a book, that's the project you want to do. And you're like, ah, now I need to get a new project. <laughs> To hear oh. that from her is, I'm giddy. <laughs> That's great. Sean Sayer has a, a question for us. Go ahead, Sean. Uh, someone needs to unmute him, maybe. I can unmute myself. All right, beautiful. Um, all right, so uh, thank you all for these papers. Uh, I do have a question for uh, for Jack. Um, a great presentation. Um, I'm familiar with several of the uh, case studies that you're diving into and I'm interested to see where you're 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 going with this. I have a couple questions. First off, one I want you to focus on is, or to get your feedback is this question of patents. Um, I've dealt with this multiple occasions, especially with the aviation stuff, um, British patents, US patents, um, the role of government in denying or supporting patent claims. Um, so I was wondering if you have come across any of this in your work, particularly um, whether or not the U.S. government was willing to support and defend these German patent holders' rights, or just to basically um, reject those those rights and allow uh, domestic companies to take uh, the technologies. So the, I've done a little bit of work with how the government dealt with patents in these regards. Um, the one I've done the most work is in the Bausch case study. And in the Bausch case study, um, Carl Zeiss is allowed to keep their German patents. Bausch and Lamb keeps their American patents. But in the agreement, they both agree for a free exchange of information between the two. Um, so they're still allowed to patent their own innovations, but they have to share with one another. And what's further is that Bausch has to pay Zeiss a subsidy on all its equipment, whether it uses Zeiss information or not. Um, and the main, I realize I, I didn't kind of explain this well in the presentation. The main reason all these German firms wanna work with American firms rather than just kind of getting like a big lump sum of cash is cause the German mark is basically collapsing. I think, uh, you know, before the war starts, it's worth $4 or four marks to the dollar. By the end of the war, it's 50 marks to the dollar, and it only slides further. Um, so the Americans are pretty well, or they're willing to let the Germans keep their information so long as we can just have free access to it. So all these agreements have respect for intellectual property, but require that intellectual property be shared. Great. Um, I do, we do have the ability to go over by 10 minutes for Q&A. I forgot to mention that earlier, but I was banking on it, and it was the only thing keeping me from having a time panic attack uh, during, during the presentation. So, um, uh, Eric, I was wondering if you wanted to respond to Angela, um, and then Mike, if, if Mike is going to stick around, uh, he has a question for Jack. Yeah, thanks. I'm happy to. 
So in, in general, what limited the acceptance of the reforms was kind of like a, a multilateral series of issues. The first was the fact that the, the German Air Force, because Germany actually owned the intellectual property rights to the F-104G Starfighter. Like, and so they're, the, my dissertation examines this. Essentially, like they, they bought the airplane to sell to NATO to like elevate their place in NATO. And so they were trying to bolster confidence in the aircraft so they could sell it to the Dutch, the Belgians, the Italians, and then eventually 11 other air forces that would buy the F-104G. And so they had, they, they tried to fix everything in real time. They had a series of high level F-104 like working groups that reported directly to like the commanding general of the air force. And you know, they would just like a new crisis would come up and they'd say, okay, we gotta fix this. And then they would just put that on the pile with the other ones. Like nothing ever really got fixed. And whenever they'd be like, they like members of the Bundestag, especially like in the SPD, which was in the um, opposition at that point in time, would frequently send questionnaires to the air force like, hey, Four aircraft crashed yesterday. What's going on in the Air Force? And they would say, "Oh no, no, that's that's a freak accident. They were they were doing some maneuver they shouldn't have been doing. It's fine. We got this. We got everything under control. This is fine. Everything's fine." They stop asking questions. And because at the time leadership and the political leadership in Germany was the conservative CDU, which was very much like they were the promulgators of this F one four strategy, it got swept under the rug constantly. And so it wasn't. And, but eventually, like the, the pressure came mostly internally from West Germany. Like the West German public was skeptical of the military in general. There's a there's a big undercurrent of kind of like anti-military feeling in West Germany uh, in the post-war period. And as these crashes continually like, you know, they make headlines because you see a bunch of starfighters crash in your in your backyard, you're gonna notice those things. And so it, eventually it just kind of everything kind of came to a head in like 1965. Um, the public was very unhappy with the starfighter program. NATO, because they were like they they realized the West Germans like their, their safety record was twice as bad as the rest of the, of the like NATO Air Force that operated the Starfighter. And they're like, what is going on? And they sent like a high level investigation team to investigate the entirety of their Starfighter program. And their results were published. Like they were, they were given to the Western, Western press. And the Western press was like, oh my God. Like, and it was at that point, I think that like the, the, the political establishment, the German public, everybody got on the same page of like the Air Force is incapable of handling this aircraft. Like from a just like fundamental level, they are incapable of handling this aircraft. They, they put so much more attention and resources and emphasis on just buying as many as they can get relative to taking care of them. And it's killed 47 people. So for basically, it just winds up being this like pressure cooker over the course of five years. And so by 1965, 66, um, it just becomes apparent that they, they can't fix this in real time and they can't hide that they can't fix it anymore. And so, to bring up leadership infrastructure, that's exactly what like the politicians in West Germany realize the leadership is just rotten to its core. And so they dismiss everybody. Everybody gets dismissed. And they bring in Johannes Steinhoff, who's like this, um, he becomes like the, the great reformer of the West German Air Force. Um, and was it like it was an active starfighter pilot himself. Like he maintained a high, like he tried to bolster confidence in the plane, he flew like a thousand hours a year kind of thing. And his reforms emphasize professionalism. At like at the NCO and the officer level. Like he knew he couldn't overcome the conscript problems. But when he grounded the fleet, he instituted all these logistics reforms, all these infrastructure reforms. And the personnel reforms are the only ones he really can't overcome ever. Like the, the Bundeswehr never, to this day, never has enough volunteers to serve in it. And so he emphasizes professionalism at the upper echelons of the NCO and the officer class. And his, his, his sort of, his leadership doctrine is what the West German Air Force uses until 1993 when the Cold War is over. So like there is a big infrastructure infrastructure fix at the leadership level as well that also like you know goes on for decades. <laughs> Great, we have a couple more minutes for questions. And again, if you're in the audience and you could do your little hand, uh, what is these things called? Reaction. Uh, if you have a question, um, uh, Mike Hankins has a, a question. Mike, do you wanna? Um, yeah, there's Mike. Hello, Go for it, Mike. Uh, good morning. Thanks, everybody. Uh, what a great panel. Uh, this is awesome. It's great to see some of you again, uh, that I haven't seen in a while. Uh, this is a question for Jack, and this is this might be a little bit beyond the scope of what you were looking at. I'm just curious. Um, you know, something that is I've come across a lot is this post World War II influence. Obviously, there's the technology. Uh, you know, everybody's scrambling to get the Nazi tech, but there's also this kind of cultural doctrinal influence. Like people are just within the US Army and Air Force especially, there's this kind of cult of the, you know, we're kind of interested in the Wehrmacht and 
some folks are, I would say, go as far as to be obsessed with it and they, they want to, you know, try to copy the doctrine. For some reason, it has a very powerful influence and that's been pretty well studied. But have you found that type of thing for World War I? Is there like that type of cultural influence and people, you know, looking at the German military of World War I as some sort of inspirational thing? Yes. Uh, <laughs> the short answer is yes. Um, what I would say is I think a personal fault I have with a lot of the literature on Operation Paperclip is that they look at American fascination with science and engineering and they say, this is a product of World War II, which is not necessarily wrong, but it's incomplete. The United States has been obsessed with German technology and engineering since about the 1870s. For the first 20 years of its awarding, uh, the Nobel Prize in chemistry and in physics was dominated by Germans. Um, the Nobel Prize in chemistry actually came to be called the German medal. Um, so, you do have this interest from the war itself uh, hooked into this longer running interest in German science. But in World War I, um, and to kind of go to Angela's um, comment about why the losers, even though they lost, there's this perception that like they gave one hell of a fight, that there were multiple instances when the Germans should not have been like holding ground, and they were. So in 1917, the, Allied were, the Allies were fielding twice as many planes as the Germans, but the Germans were killing three times as many British pilots as their own. Um, you look at Jutland, where the entire Royal Navy was lying in wait for the German Navy. They had no idea. And not only was the German Navy not destroyed, but they inflicted disproportionate attrition upon the Royal Navy. Um, so even though they lose, there's this sense of, holy crap, where the hell did that come from? <laughs> um, and that's part of what, along with this longer running interest, what fuels this intense interest in, we got to get our hands on this stuff. Cool, thank you. Well, maybe we should hang it up there. I think if we do another round of Q&A, uh, we'll probably run over time. And I think we should try not to do that. So. Thank you all. This was a, a wonderful, uh, you know, infrastructure makes my heart warm. And this was a great little uh, panel. Thanks for putting it together, Larry. And Angela, thanks for, um, you know, thanks for commenting. And thanks, guys, for uh, these great papers. Everyone have a good day. And hopefully I'll see you at another panel. Thank you, everybody. Have a good day.